Um, I am Frankie Bonte. My call sign is KE8HPA. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, um, a look at um, space weather and the effects on a radio communication with the theme of Stranger Things, which is um, Netflix television series. So um, firstly, just an overview of my presentation. I'm going to do a little introduction and then talk about a lot of strange phenomena in nature um, and how this strange phenomena impacts societies. Um, with a lot of these phenomena occurring, um, there are a lot of citizen science solutions. And then I'll give a little results and conclusion of my experiment. This is just um, a little bit more about myself. I am uh, studying engineering and dance at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Um, and I've been licensed as an amateur radio operator since 2017. And since then, I've done a lot of research using radios and technology like this. Um, as Carol Perry mentioned, I did my senior capstone project on 5G antenna sighting. Um, and I've enjoyed working with a lot of young girls in STEAM fields and um, doing presentations like this are just a really fun opportunity, uh, you know, to get involved um, as youth. And uh, yes, and um, also Carol Perry mentioned the QSO today, uh, Ham Radio Expo this summer, which was a really fabulous opportunity to, um, to work with other youth in the program. I'm also an RCA Young Achiever, which is very exciting. Um, so how many of you got to see the Netflix series um, Stranger Things? Um, it's now in its fourth season since it came out in 2016. And um, the show takes place in Hawkins, Indiana in the 1980s, and it definitely brings out your imagination. A lot of ham radio operators took notice to the Radio Shack walkie-talkies that were used and the Heathkit School Club station. I was enthralled by all of the strange phenomena that was occurring in this upside down. Um, the upside down is not fully understood by the cast of characters. But the upside down definitely affects all of life in Hawkins, Indiana. Um, the upside down causes changes in Hawkins' magnetic field and creates shifts in the power grid. This is not unlike space weather. Space weather um, and all these natural events on Earth can impact not only things like RF radio, propagation, but life on Earth in general. Now is an exciting time for radio communication because the sun has started solar cycle 25. Every 11 years or so, the north and south pole of the sun changes. This creates many new sunspots and coronal mass ejections, which cause changes in space weather. As you can see in this picture, there are some um, points on the sun, like the sunspots and um, solar flares that are caused on the outside of the corona um, in this image of the sun. Another strange natural phenomena caused by space weather is aurora borealis, also called the polar lights, the northern, northern or southern lights. Solar wind causes changes in Earth's magnetic field, which alters the path of a lot of charged particles. These particles can precipitate into Earth's upper atmosphere, and the ionization of these protons and electrons, these charged particles, can emit light with a lot of varying color, which creates this beautiful aurora. Um, this picture is from NASA. It just shows a lot of green and purple lights, um, aurora borealis, which is really beautiful. Another strange phenomenon is solar eclipses, and what an interesting, strange thing this is. Um, solar eclipses have been identified throughout history, and it's just really interesting to see a lot of historical examples of um, accounts that people have had um, with these solar eclipses, having no idea, like, why is the sun just disappearing during the day? Um, this is definitely that's something similar to the upside down in Stranger Things. We know why solar eclipses occur, but there is so much more for us to learn about what happens during these solar eclipses. We know our ionosphere is affected by the daily cycles from day to night, but what happens to the ionosphere during a solar eclipse? Can the effects of a solar eclipse and all of this on the ionosphere be seen throughout the world, or is it limited to the areas along the path of travel? And what happens to these radio waves during solar eclipses? 
So there are many people in the radio community that are studying what happens during solar eclipses. There is a solar eclipse happening in December 14th over South America. Um, Christina Collins from Case Western Reserve University is working on a propagation research project to collect data from South America during this eclipse to see what strange things are occurring. Um, this is an image of the projected um, path of travel of the solar eclipse that is occurring in 2024. Another strange phenomena, uh, temperature inversion at the poles caused by magnetic heating. Um, this creates high temperature above the North Pole, which pushes a lot of this cold air south. Um, this cause what's, causes what's called um, a polar vortex and is often called polar express. Um, this image shows um, the water cycle, but uh, the point is that the temperature inver inversion and other strange phenomena like this can affect uh, a lot of terrestrial weather as well. So what are some specific examples of these phenomena changing things on Earth? Um, so a lot of these large disturbances can really have a great impact on our electrical and electronic systems as well. So in 1859, there was an event called the Carrington event um, that occurred on Earth. And it was due to, a, so, and during this time in 1859, um, a lot of sunspots were observed um, on the sun. Later, a coronal mass ejection hit Earth's magnetic field and induced one of the largest geomagnetic storms on record. The electromagnetic conditions were so intense that it overwhelmed many systems. During the Carrington event, telegraphs were running not connected to a power source. Um, on the lower left-hand corner, there's an image from the New York Times um, that was talking about that Aurora was ob observed brilliantly in Boston. So I actually want to take a moment to read this because I just think this is so interesting. Um, this is from an, uh, published September 3rd in 1859. There was another display of the Aurora last night, so brilliant that at one o'clock, ordinary print could be read by the light. The effort continued through this forenoon, considerably affecting the working of the telegraph lines. The auroral currents from the east to west were so regular that the operators from the eastern lines were able to hold communication and transmit messages over the line between this city and Portland, the usual batteries being disconnected from the wire. The same effects were exhibited on the Cape Cod and other lines. The, um, however, this is not an isolated event that hasn't happened since. In 1989, an electrical power blackout occurred in Quebec. A solar flare caused shortwave radio interference and the northern lights were seen as close to the equator as Florida and Cuba. Although this event is totally different, um, it's, it goes to show that a lot of these large disturbances have really great impacts on our electrical and electronic systems. Furthermore, what would happen if the Carrington event happened today? Well, there are many devices today that are controlled by electronics and circuits. A lot of devices are tuned or set to a small range of what would be considered normal conditions, like uh, normal temperature or normal magnetic field. If we drastically change these things, like the magnetic field of an area, this could cause uh, conductors to create excess induced current. This could wipe out memory or break down circuits. Um, overwhelm capacitors, or greatly change the speeds in electric motors. If the Carrington event happened today, cars could stop working because of their dependence on a lot of these electric systems. Um, remotely controlled uh, devices such as ATM machines would fail, and GPS navigation wouldn't work because of the communication line to satellites and remote controlling would be interrupted. This could cause a lot of great issues like financial issues because of ATM machines stop working or social unrest. And academics estimate that it would take about $2 trillion in damage if the Carrington event happened today and about four to 10 years to recover from this event. This shows that we need to be able to predict future solar events like this to prevent a lot of further damage. So I've talked about some phenomena that we can see and feel on Earth. Now, what do all of these events have in common? Well, each of these events are linked to space weather. 
Space weather refers to the conditions on the sun in the space environment that can influence the performance and reliability of a lot of these space-borne as well as ground-based technological systems. And all of this can have a lot of impact on human life and health. Um, some examples of space weather, um, electron content in um, the atmosphere, a lot of the geomagnetic conditions on Earth, um, and events like solar eclipses and lightning that can occur on Earth. And um, the image also shows a lot of the interrelated um, electric um, things that help run our societies as well as their um, impact by weather, terrestrial weather and solar weather as well. So studying the space weather isn't something that is new, but our understanding of space weather is not very developed. This is where scientists like Dr. Nathaniel Frisell are helping to improve these models. Um, shown in this image, we have the Space Weather Prediction Center, which offers a lot of basic space weather predictions that are still very useful, but um, some of these things are based on like radio blackouts, solar radiation storms, and geomagnetic storms, which you can see um, as the, the RSG that is shown in the screenshot from the, from the homepage. So in our TV show, Stranger Things, the cast of characters, including the children, their parents, teachers, and the law enforcement officers, all collaborate to figure out how to stop the upside down from taking over. No more spoilers than that. In the show, they all act like citizen scientists to obtain data from their surroundings and monitor systems to make new discoveries to solve these problems that they are facing. All of these people are part of the solution. Now, citizen science has been in the news more often in recent months because of the need to collect large data sets related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, citizen science has been around for a long time in many disciplines and fields of study. For instance, the Citizen Science Association, CSA, is a member-driven organization which is to, well, their purpose is to connect people and advance knowledge through research for, by, and with all of the members of the public. And it was founded in the United States in 2013. A citizen science organization that I've been involved with is HAMSCI, which is led by Dr. Nathaniel Frisell, who presented earlier this morning. The goal of HAMSCI is to advance scientific research using amateur radio activities. Along with this, they are encouraging the development of new technologies and providing educational opportunities to the public. Some of the projects of HAMSI include these um, listed with um, AM broadcast monitoring and HF frequency measurements. Um, this picture to the right is from Dayton Hamvention. And it's really interesting to see that all of the people involved in HAMSI are like the cast of characters who are seeking out um, the solutions to a lot of these world problems. One specific project that I've been involved in is the Personal Space Weather Station project. Let me introduce it to you uh, by first saying this. Um, everyone's familiar with the um, ubiquitous weather station. Um, this picture here shows an example of a terrestrial weather station that many people have. It measures things like air temperature, relative humidity, and um, the amount of precipitation with very good accuracy. These weather stations are so common that if I wanted to know what is the wind speed in Cleveland, Ohio right now, I could look it up and see. Well, HAMSI's objective is to have a personal space weather station like this widespread to collect data regarding solar weather. They want to these, make these stations very widespread to create more data points from which conclusions can be drawn. The predictability of these stranger things could improve greatly if the number of space weather stations increases over a widespread area on Earth. So this personal space weather station is a multi-instrument device based on the ground to observe space weather and the effects for both space scientists and ham radio operators. There are many different teams working on different instruments, such as the software defined radio SDR that will monitor radio waves um, to sample noise levels, Doppler shift and other phenomena such as this. There will also be a GPS discipline oscillator, which will help establish precise frequency and time. 
Um, also, a magnetometer will help collect changes in Earth's magnetic field. All of this data will be collected and uploaded to the internet and available for analysis by anyone. As you can see in the image, there is the HAMSI public database. Here is some more specific information on the Personal Space Weather Station. Um, the point is to make the price range easily accessible and um, have a nice user interface with a small, relatively small footprint. Um, and most of this is it's um, supposed to be open and community driven design. Another important point to mention is that um, the more data points, the more accurate conclusions can be drawn. So that's why um, it's important to have a lot of these instruments and more widespread. So what are the benefits of the Personal Space Weather Station? And how does the partnership um, between scientists and citizens like ham radio operators um, further this mission? Well, um, as you can see, the scientists really benefit this from this from the research aspect. Um, they're able to better sample the environment um, and have some better understandings of near Earth space with um, more advanced scientific understanding. And amateur radio operators or other citizens involved, um, you know, can get more information about frequencies to work and um, especially enhanced emergency communications, which is important when there's a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty and strange phenomena and strange weather conditions on Earth. Now, over the other parameters that I mentioned, such as the ionospheric disturbances and HF noise, I am going to talk a little bit more about the piece that I helped with on this project, which is the ground magnetometer. So in the, in the show Stranger Things, um, Joyce Byers, which was played by Winona Ryder, um, was having a hard time figuring out why her magnets were becoming demagnetized in the television show. So uh, she went to talk to um, her kid's science teacher about this. Um, in early school, we are taught this is what Earth's magnetic field looks like. Earth has a magnetic north and a magnetic south pole, and magnetic field lines originate and end in these poles. However, this is more kind of the picture that scientists look at. In reality, Earth's magnetic field is being pushed by the sun and changed by solar wind. As you can see in the picture, solar flares, um, the solar cycle itself and a lot of these coronal mass ejections impact different things on Earth, um, like the ionosphere and phenomena such as the aurora, which we mentioned earlier. Keeping with the 80s theme of the presentation, this is also just a, um, a, a silly example of kind of what that the wind and the solar um, is affecting um, Earth. Earth's magnetic field can change and move under the influence of the sun. Uh, this GIF shows the magnetic field moving due to solar wind, and um, it is something like this that it caused aurora borealis on Earth. When scientists measure Earth's magnetic field, they measure it in three planes, often using very expensive equipment to get, the, get a, um, a large precise accuracy. Um, it is measured in the X, Y, and Z direction. Um, on this graph shown, um, on the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have measuring the magnetic field in microteslas. And each of the colored lines shows a different direction in the magnetic field. So um, the green, red, and black line each show the x, y, and z direction. Um, this graph was provided by Supermag, and uh, Supermag has a very large stationary magnetometer that is very accurate, but it's also very large and very expensive. For our purposes in the Personal Space Weather Station, it makes sense to use a lot smaller device um, that is also more cost effective. Um, for our purposes, we used a PNI RM3100 magnetometer, which is pictured. The instrument is relatively small. As you can see, it's about the size of a quarter, but it is very good for both that, the size and um, cost. Um, another important thing to mention is that the importance of the magnetometer is not only in the actual measurements, but in the change of the magnetic field and um, versus like the literal readings that the graph gives you. Um, so this is, this is a good device to use for that. Um, the magnetometer itself works because of three RL um, resistor inductor oscillation circuits on the board 
that measure Earth's magnetic field in one direction each. Um, the horizontal circuits, as shown by the red box, the two horizontal pieces, that's the X and Y directions, and the vertical red box um, that is outlining where that um, circuit is, is uh, for the Z direction. Um, so this magnetometer can be used in conjunction with devices like a temperature sensor and a real-time clock to create a data set um, to discover this change in Earth's magnetic field. And as we can see, the, um, this magnetometer will be very useful to, to look at space weather and radio propagation just because of how much the um, magnetic field is impacted by the sun. In order to test the use of this magnetometer, I used an Arduino with an I squared C, um, a real-time clock, and a data logger on a micro SD card. Um, the image shown is how I implemented the magnetometer using an Arduino. Uh, the PNI RM3100 magnetometer that we used is shown on the bottom left corner of the layout board, but um, this, these are just all the devices that we used in order to um, not only receive the data, but then also um, connect this data so that we can see it on our computer. So this image to the right um, shows the setup. Uh, as you can see in the picture, we didn't exactly um, plumb and level the magnetometer to, and put it in place. This is when we were still um, figuring out how to connect the magnetometer to the support board and to the computer to receive the data. But it was also very interesting to be able to move the magnetometer and see how that um, affected the data in um, real time. So this also was able to help, um, you know, solidify the idea that the orientation of the magnetometer is very important to the data collection. So with this setup, we collected data every 30, 30 seconds and sent it to the micro SD card, which was sent to our computer via a serial port. The data collected was shown on the computer in ISO format, which was very easy to use in a program like Excel so we could um, timestamp it using the real-time clock module and then be able to send the data or more easily analyze it. Um, it is intended to place this magnetometer outdoors in an outdoor setup that is um, weatherproof and stationary. Um, to get more data collection. Um, but as of right now, we are getting the data via a serial connection. So it is important to figure out how to send the data remotely in the future. Uh, we have made the magnetometer case that um, will serve this purpose. Um, and in the future, it will be very interesting to see how the magnetometer will be integrated into the rest of the devices um, and the personal space weather station. So in summary, there are many strange natural disturbances in space that can impact humans and societies. And I think it is necessary that there be some improvements in the predictability of these events in the future. Citizen science and citizen science organizations such as HAMSI are working hard to create a lot of these instruments and ways to increase the predictability for widespread utilization. The Personal Space Weather Station project by HAMSI is just one way to increase predictability predictability of these solar events and space weather phenomena in the future. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of these people, including Dr. Nathaniel Frisell, um, with all of his work with HAMSI and the New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, all of the citizens and scientists of HAMSI um, for a lot of the content of this presentation, and especially um, Carol Perry, John Fisella, Dr. Rakel, David Bart for all of the help with this presentation and to all the people who support Carol Perry's youth activities because that has been, it has been very great for me to be involved in these activities and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what other um, youth activities there are in the future. So, so thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Frankie, excellent Oops. presentation. Sorry. Uh, I feel like everybody is clapping loudly <laughs> and uh, cheering you on. And uh, welcome to our two moderators for this session, Trey Garlow and Barney Scholl. And uh, Trey, you want to start us off with a question. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A uh, for Frankie. And uh, Trey, first question. You're muted, Trey. Good morning, uh, Frankie and everyone. Uh, Roy asks, on the PWS, 
Is there an effort to add the space weather monitoring function to the existing systems like Davis or AccuWeather? Um, that is a really good question. I um, am not really sure about that, but I know that a lot of the, of the goal for the um, personal space weather station is to have all of the data be um, open source um, and posted on um, the HAMSI um, a database for anyone to look at or analyze. Okay, another question, uh, Barney, for Frankie. Hi, Frankie. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was, uh, do you have any idea what you're going to do uh, when you when you finish your schooling and, and uh, however far you decide to go? <laughs> that is a really good question as well. Um, I So as of right now, I am doubling, double majoring in engineering and dance. I am a ballerina also. So that's um, something that's been really fun for me and seeing the connection even between engineering and dance. Um, and I'm also um, studying Spanish as well in school. So um, I, I don't know where I'm gonna go. Um, in the immediate future, but I've been really interested in um, a lot of the um, connection between electronic systems and um, material science. So, so I've been taking a lot of those classes right now. Um, I just, I'm about to finish my course in electricity and magnetism, um, my physics course in that. So I'm really excited to see what classes I'll take next semester and uh, keep going from there. <laughs> Trey, another question for Frankie. Frankie, uh, we're wondering if you could comment on uh, uh, comparing the your 5G site survey work with a uh, 4G LTE stuff. Are there any major differences in the antenna siting for those two types of systems? Well, the the only thing that's really different is that there um, for the 5G stuff, it's a lot smaller antennas, but a lot more of them. So a lot of the 5G antennas are very they can be discreetly placed on something like a pre-existing. Um, uh, component like a street light or something like that. Um, so, but there's a lot more of these um, 5G antenna sightings versus these 4G ones. But that was a really interesting um, project to work on. It was um, with a group of people. It was a. It was intended to be a civic action project. So we had to do a lot of research and communication with um, with um, um, members of our legislation and community. So just to just to see how they um, were taking the those um, new advancements into, into account for legislation as well. Uh, thank you, Frankie. Barney, another question for Frankie. Frankie, uh, there was a question, but to sort of follow through on what you were talking about before, uh, you mentioned uh, one form of dance that you were studying. Uh, do you get involved in other forms of dance in your studies? And then they also ask about uh, outside of the studies, do you do other types of dance outside? Yes, I do. Um, so I mostly study classical ballet and modern dance. Um, but what is really neat about my the dance department at Case Western is their integration of technology into the dancing. So one of the recent um, uh, performances that they did was using the Microsoft HoloLens, where everyone in the audience had these hollow lenses on. And a lot of the set and display was um, caused by a lot of these holographic programs being sent to the viewer. So the dancers on stage were interacting with these holograms, which was something that was really interesting to do, how these hollow lenses had to communicate with um, all of the, the internet in the building and then to create this immediate visual feedback of the holograms and the dancers at the same time, which was very interesting to see this um, cross of technology. but. Um, so yeah, I mostly study classical ballet and modern dance. Um, so I've been in the Nutcracker many times. So <laughs> if um, you're all familiar with the, the Nutcracker, but yeah, so outside of dance, I'm involved in a lot of modern dance troops on um, Case Western's campus. And uh, yeah, so right now we're not doing a lot of performances, but hopefully in the future, we'll get back to doing some more in-person performances. Right. And uh, Trey, another question for Frank. Yeah, getting back to the Citizen uh, Space Weather Station, uh, uh, can you give us a, a view on what the costs are involved per unit? Um, so this is probably something that um, Dr. Nathaniel Frisell could answer better. Um, I know a little bit more about um, specifically the magnetometer instrument. Um, the magnetometer itself is relatively low cost for what we found uh, based on research that the PNI RM3100 would probably be the best accuracy for the, the low cost um, that it is. I'm not exactly sure of the unit price, but, um, 
but I'm sure Dr. Nathaniel Frisell can um, talk more about the, the personal space weather station costs as a whole. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, would you uh, give us a quick update there? Sure. So we have two different personal space weather station tracks. We have a low cost version and a more performance based version. So the low cost version, um, we're aiming to be, uh, say, around $100 to $150. And the more performance based version, we're probably aiming to be around five or six hundred dollars. Okay, very good. Thank you, Nathaniel. And Barney, another question for Frankie. Yes, Frankie, one popped up that I was thinking about myself. Uh, can you share any experience you have uh, enjoyed in being a ham radio operator and talking with others? And have you spoken with other women in the countries via amateur radio? And I was even thinking is, uh, do you have any direct experiences of influencing other, especially uh, women, and to get into the uh, hobby? Yes, absolutely. Well, um, a lot of my first um, interactions with ham radio were because of my, my dad and my younger brother. And my younger brother was also um, a youth presenter at um, Carol Perry's Youth Forum at the Dayton Hamvention. And it was there that I really got to interact first with a lot of other youth and young women as well um, in amateur radio. And um, I definitely say that Ms. Carol Perry has been a, a very big um, um, guide for me in a lot of ham radio activities and being a mentor for others. So um, there's, I've met a lot of other women such as Audrey McElroy, um, I believe, who was also a presenter at um, the QSO today and um, a few other young women um, in that. But mostly I, I um, have been working several years as a um, mentor for young girls in STEAM fields. So science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, because um, I also like to include the art because of um, my dance background. So I always think that's um, something to add for, into the STEM fields. Um, but I've been working with a lot of young girls for several years as a tutor, but also, um, you know, getting them involved in, in um, thinking what, what solutions they can come up with to these problems. So there's um, an event that I um, help with where it's um, girls, young girls all get to come and um, we present them with some several problems and they have the whole day to prototype and come up with solutions. And then at the end, they present them to um, um, a group of women so to, to come in who come in and uh, listen to them speak and it is so interesting to see all of these young girls come up with these brilliant ideas together on solutions to important things like um, education was a major topic one year so we did a, well, a lot of their solutions to some problems in education that they see and resources or like even things like they had some ideas about like school lunches and things like that but they're just really really inspiring ideas so um it's it's Good that there's a lot of people who are willing to help out and make um, be mentors for these young girls. And uh, Trey, another question for Frankie. Frankie, uh, 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 one of the questions uh, asked was uh, in studying the magnetic field, you talked about the X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, could you explain to us what is X and what is Y and what is Z? What is the reference point for? Uh, how those axes are okay. established or defined. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the axes are defined. So the Z axis is um, up and down, I believe. So on. So I've been also working with a, another magnetometer device for my electricity and magnetism lab. And they, um, the device is oriented based on like, uh, for this device, this other device, um, it gives you the axes that it's measuring in. So for, for this specific device, the X it is the device moving forward and backward, and then Y would be side to side and Z up and down for that specific orientation. But as you move the magnetometer, it can vary what the axes are defined as. So Barney, another question for Frankie. Frankie, we have a question from Jim Brakehall, who is also an alumni of Case Western, and he's wondering if you can update us on the status of uh, W8EDU and the, their ongoing projects up there. Absolutely. Um, which, something that's really interesting is that's how I um, came to find Case Western Reserve University was a lot of the ham radio activities that were going on there. Um, and then I further got to learn more about Case and their dance department and a lot of their engineering activities and their makerspace, the wonderful makerspace. It's seven stories of 
it's called the think box. Oh my goodness. And I, I just really like all the activities that they're, they're working on there. But um, so the club station W8EDU, they just finished renovating um, their ham shack. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit because of a lot of the um, COVID-19 precautions, but they are working on a lot of different projects, um, especially with licensing exams, getting people licensed, and um, several different events like that. But I think the big, the big thing that we just did is renovating the, the ham shack at WAEDU. And uh, Trey, another question for Frankie. Um... Any thoughts as to why the magnetic North Pole is moving and is, does this affect uh, your research? Was that for you? No. Um, that is a really good question. Um, the magnetic North Pole, um, it, I just know that because of, um, the magnetic North Pole shifts on the sun um, every 11 years, I believe. So, um, I, I'm, I actually do, I don't know if I know the answer to that question, but that is a really good question. May I jump in for a second? Yeah, yeah please. Sure. Okay, sure. So um, we don't fully understand why the magnetic pole is shifting around. Uh, that's still an area of, you know, of research, uh, exactly how the magnetic field inside the Earth is generated and what causes it. Um, but we do know that it does move around. We do also, it does affect our research as well. We need to account for how it's moving, especially when we compare with our, our models. So one thing that's really interesting in space physics research is we actually separate out the in Earth's internal magnetic field from the Earth's external magnetic field. So as a space physicist, we're more interested in how the magnetic field is changing because of influences from space, from uh, solar weather. So we need to account for what the internal field is doing, know where that is, and then we try to remove that factor and get the information about how the external field is changing. Okay, thank you, Nathaniel. And I see there was some answers also in the chat about that, so uh, good place for that. Um, let's go uh, to Barney and uh, another question for Frankie. Yes, Frankie, there was a, a comment and uh, you may have to explain it to the rest of us. Uh, the comment was they trust you will eventually be participating in the dance your PhD competition. Are you familiar uh, with that? I'm not familiar with that. Well, maybe Lisa will add a little bit more later to yeah, the chat. Yeah, that, that sounds very interesting. That sounds right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trey, another question for Frankie. I think that's all that I have at this time, Barney. Um, well, I was going to ask, and I don't know whether you or uh, maybe Nathaniel, but as these personal weather stations are being developed, is there, will there be any movement to uh, make them fairly, almost buy one off the shelf? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are, we're working with Tapper. And so Tapper does have a, uh, a procedure for basically developing a, a certain number of these things uh, and selling them through their store. So yes, so basically everything will be available through the Tapper store that you can buy. And I'm excited to say that we actually are just, um, we have just done a prototype production of the magnetometer components. And so we're sending that out to a, a few different people right now. So hopefully once that gets tested a little bit uh, more, uh, then we'll start seeing the magnetometer component at least be available in the Tapper store in the very near future. So we're, we're working on it. And so the answer is yes. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Carol Perry, for uh, bringing Frankie to the uh, technical symposium today. Uh, tremendous job. Frankie, we wish you all the best and, uh, in your future studies. I wish you good luck in dance. Uh, it sounds like you have a pretty full, as uh, that we used to say, dance card. And uh, it sounds like your schedule is jam-packed, and uh, we couldn't be more proud of you. And uh, thank you very much for coming on today, Frankie. Thank you so much for this opportunity.